Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining the Making It as a Photojournalist um, uh, presentation. My name is Robert Burns. Thank you for your time and joining us today. So what we're doing today is we're going to, so I actually put together a, a slide by slide presentation. It's a, it's a slide deck of about 70 something slides. Some of them has uh, some of my work in there. Um, and then, you know, we also have some, some detail on, you know, some, some pretty detailed information on like how we can actually make a career out of um, photography, photojournalism, journalism, um, anything in this industry because there's, there's a lot of technology out there, there's a lot of mirrorless cameras and even film cameras, but there's not a lot of info on like how to get started and how to monetize your camera. Um, through photojournalism. So with that said, um, Laura, I know you've been waiting. Uh, I'm going to get going. So I'm going to go ahead and um, share my screen. And so this is what well, we, you know, the, they asked me, you know, shout out to, to University of Georgia, shout out to Grady College. And first and foremost, shout out to, um, shout, shout out to my, my very first, um, um, photography teacher Mark Johnson who um, you know definitely you know see some heads nodding right there shout out to Mark Johnson um, we appreciate everything that Grady has been able to do um, my career uh, you know I've had a few different careers but photography was the was the one that actually um, was my passion uh, and I didn't even realize it at the time I remember going to Mark Johnson's class back in 2009 like I, it was basically photojournalism was an elective um, major, and I had no interest in photography because I was back in high school, and uh, I wasn't interested in film at the time. This is 2005, 2004, and I had zero interest in photography. I remember looking at it and kind of like snickering, and then I entered the journalism program at Grady, where I very much wanted to be a writer. I was very interested in working for the New York Times or for USA Today or maybe one of the smaller papers in one of these smaller cities. I grew up in Philly. And uh, that was that was the goal. I transferred schools from the University of Georgia, uh, sorry, from, um, from Morehouse College in Atlanta to the University of Georgia my sophomore year. The idea was that I was going to go from Morehouse, where they had no journalism program, to go to Georgia, where they had a fantastic journalism program. So I was all in on journalism. And um, I remember it like the back of my hand, you know, you have to take, of course, as you know, you'd have to take, um, you know, these other courses outside of just your, your intended field of study. So I took photojournalism just because I was like, okay, well, I guess I could learn something. The very first day I fell in love with it. Mark Johnson put up, I believe it was a T3I or a T5 in my hands. It might've been T3 at that time. And, um, He's, you know, they said you can go ahead and take it home for the semester. I took it home the first day and fell in love with it. And I had never taken photos before. And after that, you know, kind of, I, I would love to say that the rest is history, but it's not. So just as it wasn't, the rest of it wasn't just history for me and there was a lot of learning lessons along the way, um, that's what we're gonna be talking about a little bit today. Uh, so I, I wanted to start off with the, with the point of, um, you know, a lot of times when I've watched presentations like this, I've seen presentations like this live on YouTube and all these other places, people speak from this super lofty position that is not very relatable. And the number one thing about like how I approach my career is about trying to be relatable. So I want to start off by saying that, you know, I understand you and I understand like where you might be or where maybe you have been. Um, and maybe we can, from that standpoint, kind of, kind of get started. Um, so before we start getting into like the nuts and bolts of like what all, um, like the like the how to do it, some people they 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 want to know like, well, who the hell is this guy and why should I care? And so for those people out there who may feel like that, I want to start off with this. This is just a little bit about me. Um, I'll try and keep this as brief as possible because we have a lot of information to share. Um, I'm a, I'm a, I identify with being a self-taught photographer. Um, I do a lot of other things now, including videography, including licensed aerials, drone work, um, teaching as well. Um, I'm an educator. 
But I didn't start off teaching. I didn't start off doing drone work in 2008, 2009. I didn't start off shooting wedding films. I, I started off just taking pictures um, of like um, macro photography, really. I remember being outside of Grady and walking in the, you know, in the in the uh, in the lot, walking around Tate, just taking pictures, you know. Um, oh, I think it's still called Tate. I, I believe it still is. Yeah, I got a head nod there. See, you, you know, I've been to campus. I know campus. So right now, what I do, I'm a wedding photographer in Charlotte. Um, I lived in Charlotte for like the last, uh, well, pretty much after. Uh, I stayed in Athens for about a year following graduation. Um, I was employed very quickly following um, my graduation. But the, the company that I started to work for, they had issues, and I didn't do photography at that time. I was actually working in PR, um, which is another great field. Uh, so I worked in PR for about eight, nine months, and then the company started having financial problems. They kind of looked like they might be moving to another city, relocate, and I was just like, I'm not interested in that. So a job in insurance is what brought me to Charlotte. So that's what why I'm here. Um, I ended up staying for a lot of other reasons, but I love this city now. So I'm originally from Philly. I lived in Georgia, and now I live in Charlotte. I have 12 years in the trenches, so I've been doing this since before I graduated University of Georgia. So I say that because a lot of people are like, well, you know, like, 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 when I say in the trenches, I mean working with clients presently. That's what I mean. Um, so that's a little bit about my background, insurance, photography. Um, I did do photography on a, on, I've, I've always done photography like part time, like um, as far as following graduation, I... Um, I mean, extremely part-time, like I started on Craigslist. Um, and I, honestly, I was just, basically, I was just going from the point of um, uh, just really shooting for fun, shooting for fun, shooting because I liked it, shooting because I found macro photography interesting, because I liked to photograph animals. Like I started with basically photographing other students, um, pets, and, you know, People, you know, the times were a little bit different then, and I, I, I really hate to say that because I sound all old fogey, but guess what? I have a lot of gray hair, so uh, I guess I could, <laughs> I'm young, but I have so much gray hair, you might think I'm an old fogey. Um, but long story short, like, my journey with photography and turning this into a career, I do think it's important for people to know. Um, so I start off with, like, Craigslist, and then eventually I started to, I didn't try to find my specialty, but over time my specialty did find me. So when I started going on Craigslist, I started advertising there. And anything just like free shoots, quick shoots, whatever, whatever, whatever. I made some of the things that I later identify as maybe uh, learning lessons, some people will call them mistakes, but that's where I started. And again, times were different. Knowing what I know now and also for people out there who are watching this, if you have the information now to do things maybe a better way, a different way, and people are telling you, hey, try this, try this, try this, and avoid this, this, and this, if you had all the information that you have now in 2021 versus what we all had in 20, 2009, or some people like 20 years ago when they started, would you do that? So that's something I want you to kind of consider. Um, like I said, I went to Grady, I'm mostly self-taught, and I consider myself more of a photography business owner than I do a typical photographer. I will definitely get into that in great detail later. Also, you know, I love my, uh, my, my, my little stuff here, my jalapenos and, and, uh, and pineapples. So that's a little bit about me, okay? Um, here is some of my work. Uh, like I said, I, I consider myself more of a business owner. I try to be um, from a position of profitability um, because... You know, we can take pretty pictures all day, and I enjoy doing that, but at the end of the day, if you're trying to depend on photography to feed you, then you have to look at it from a business perspective. And that business perspective should not, um, it should not dilute your ability to create pretty images. But what it should do is it should force you very early on to make 
decisions with your time that are going to impact the following days, like your day right now. If you spend all of your time just taking pictures, you won't have enough hours in the day to do all of the other things that are going to lead to your business ultimately being profitable. So that will be the first thing that I would impart to anybody who's watching this. And again, I'm gonna leave time for questions at the end. Um, if you have any questions right now, I will pause for a moment and maybe collect some because I do want this to be on, on point for everybody. So I'll just take like 10 seconds to pause and if everybody has a question, let me know, I'll write it down, we'll get to it. Okay, so one of the things that, and re, one of the reasons why I paused there and, and to leave this slide up is a lot of times people ask me like, like, I just started or I've been doing this for a few years and it's like, well, I'm not sure which direction to go, which lane to go. Should I just focus on one or two things or should I just do it, like take pictures like however I want to, like of all genres, like what should I do? And I remember for a long time thinking like, well, you could do it either way. And I don't think that that's wrong that you couldn't do it either way. But in, in working on this presentation, in, I, in, in working on this res presentation, I actually approached several photographers that I knew and kind of bounced some things off of them and also got some, some feedback from them. And when I thought about everybody that I knew who actually does this, um, either at a very high part-time level or full-time level, um, and I've been both part-time and full-time, uh, sorry, yeah, part-time and full-time. Um, those people generally pick one or two lanes and they and they do that. And a lot of times people are like, well, should I do one or the other? I'm like, and more and more these days, I'm suggesting you pick one or two things. So that would be one of the things that I'm gonna, I mean, it's not that you can't do other stuff, but we'll get deeper into it. So this is actually kind of what, what developed me as a photographer. I started out doing fashion. Um, when I started to really take photography seriously, I started out doing fashion. And the lessons from working within the, the genre of fashion helped me to learn what I needed to do to be successful in a different genre. And I'll elaborate on that a little bit. For me, what I do these days, I'm a wedding photographer. And weddings actually brings in a lot of different genres, whether that's portraits or that's, um, or that's um, family, family photo photography, or that is like um, landscape. It's so many different things that it brings in. Um, but at the heart of what I do, it's portraits. And fashion actually taught me how to take portraits. So you want to build upon the skills that you already have. And from the standpoint of like what you can do, these are portraits. This is a couple's portrait, but it's still a portrait. You know what I'm saying? So portraiture is something that helped me to turn this into a business. But one of the things that I made sure was that like how I was photographing these, these sessions let me put it a different way. You have to make these choices. We were talking earlier about um, we were talking earlier about making choices because you only have so much time. And what I do is I make it clear that I will photograph a lot of things, but I have I have specialties. So here, I do weddings. I'll do fashion. I'll do aerials. At this point, I do po portraits. I will do headshots, um, and of course, I'll do graduations. Now there are some things I don't do, and I make that very clear. So when people come up to me and ask me like, "Hey, would you do?" Like, not that I won't, but like, I'm I'm not I like really just I have no interest in that stuff. I don't want to do it, and I'll probably charge really high. That's just me. But the things that I act, even though I can do all these things, as you, as you see on this on the right, on the sorry on the left, on the right side, what I actively market for is just a few things. You may on occasion see me on Facebook or Instagram like, hey, 
I did this headshot, let me know if you need one. But that's not the same thing as creating an entire campaign, an entire business plan for weddings and engagements, which is what I do. So that's one of the things that you really wanna pay attention. We're about to get a little bit deeper. So how is this presentation gonna help you, right? So first and foremost, it's, you know, I shared a little bit about my story. What we're gonna do is we're gonna lay out a success model for you, like what you can actually do, um, like things that, tangible ideas that you can actually do, because we're about to move a lot faster. I'm gonna give you some ideas to try out, and I'm actually gonna share some resources with you as well. Um, I wanna encourage you, because a lot of people don't get the encouragement they need. On the freelancing side, you know, you have friends and family, parents, sometimes doubt you. They don't realize that some of these people have never run a business. They've never been a freelancer, so they don't know the struggles. But if you have tried this before, even, at a, even if you just only had two or three clients, sleepless nights, long hours, lots of coffee, um, people don't understand you, you try to explain to people like you need the support, you don't get the support, lots of questions from friends and family, friends and family, lots of, this is the kind of stuff that you're gonna deal with. So I'm here to encourage you as well. We are gonna share some stuff. I'm gonna help you see what you might already be doing that's working. If this is working, um, you may hear some things and I'll be like, this works. If you hear that, keep doing it. Um, and then also to help you identify some things that you might want to change. Um, and, and lastly, I'll, I'll share a couple people. I know in this industry, it's, it's kinda, some people are a little, they don't like to share the love. They, you know, I actually uh, reached out to a few people. I've reached out to six or seven people. Hey, like, hey, would you share? And only three or four actually replied back. So I will be very happy to share though. So who, who's some people that you could reach out to? So how to make it? What's the real question here? The real question I think people have is like how to get from like just starting to like this pot of gold. <laughs> the pot of gold where you've got endless clients where you've got dozens of, of, of contacts where you have a fully booked calendar it's my calendar over there it's for 2021 and 2022 the idea is that every single day you're going to be shooting um, and every single day you're going to be bringing in four thousand six thousand ten thousand dollar weddings or you're going to be getting this full-time job that's you're pulling in 120 or 180 whatever it takes it's going to take you know takes for you to to quote unquote make it. That is the, um, that is the, sorry, that is what people want to do. But I think that the thing is, it's like when you're, when you're looking at this, people want to essentially leapfrog over some of the challenges. It's almost like there's some sort of like a cheat code, like a magic button that we can push to get from here to here. And the reality is, there is no magic cheat code um, and but the good news is there's a lot of things that you can do that can absolutely get you closer to this okay so how can we get started how can we go from this position of zero clients never shot an assignment for pay don't have a full-time job just graduated from Grady and you are trying to create the situ situation where you're getting paid I believe that the best thing that you can do is a few things. Practice your art. Practice your art, perfect your art, and create situations where you are able to go from taking pretty pictures to creating experiences for people that, that help them to see what you do as a service and the transformation of you just taking pretty pictures to contextualizing your art in a way that is a service to other people, basically making their lives easier. In that moment, that's when you get paid. And not a minute, not a minute sooner. So here are, some here are five steps that will help you get started. Um, and this is like a, these are, these are very high level, this is bird's eye view, I get that. But from a, from a bird's eye view, you want to research what a day-to-day -day in this field is like. If you're in Grady right now or you just left Grady, you're going to want to talk to people. 
You heard me just say a few minutes ago, I still talk to peers in the industry to get a sense of like what their day to day is like. So if I'm doing it and I'm quote unquote made it, which take that for what you want, um, then it, we all can do that. Um, I actually created a tool that will help you to assess your readiness level for whether you're ready to freelance or not. And I would say that a lot of this has to do with mindset. So at the end of this presentation, I'm gonna share that with you. And at the end of this presentation, you could you know, get going with taking that assessment. Um, you're gonna to wanna to determine what makes you unique. And there's a reason why you wanna be unique because the more that you're like other people, the more that customers, clients, feel like they could go to Joe down the street or Tina around the corner or Mike in you know, the local coffee shop and they can go to them instead. The more unique you are, the more they have to come to you. And that's the cool thing. As people feel like, well, I'm not unique. I haven't, you know, it's not about being like the best. It's not about like taking the most like fire pictures. What it's about is again, contextualizing. So taking something from, from Grady, right? Some of us, we're all, we're all essentially storytellers, journalism, photojournalism, um, telecommunications. We tell stories. When you start to tell stories with what you do, that's how you show that you're unique, okay? So leveraging opportunities where you can create art in a way that others appreciate and pay for. That's, 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 that's like, so here, leveraging the opportunities that you have, that's really the operative part of this. Everybody has opportunities, but are you maximizing them? Are you ready for the opportunities when they come? Okay, so identifying is identifying the opportunities that do come your way will be one of those things. Um, cultivating and honing your portfolio, that will be the next piece. And you'll see here, they're in order. So it's one, two, three, four, five. You wanna first start off with your research. Then once, you're, once you've done some research, you wanna assess your readiness level for freelancing. After you've done that, that's when you'll start to determine, okay, what's making me a little bit more unique than other people out here? Again, we're all unique. And then once you've done that, then you can begin to leverage opportunities. But sometimes people do this out of order, and if they do it out of order, that's where the trouble goes. So I just wanted to kind of make that clear that you want to do this in order, but you'll always come back to doing more of some of the other things. So just another way of saying the same thing. Um, but there are some differences here. So this is how to get your small photography business started. So now you've gone from the, from the determination of, hey, I've left Grady or I'm in Grady. Hey, I wanna start a business on the side. Like, how can we make this happen? You're gonna create some ideas that your business is gonna, is gonna execute on. So creating the ideas um, early on will give you the fuel to be creative later. But if you don't have any ideas and you're just like, I got a camera, I wanna make money with it, your business doesn't have much to offer. Or from another standpoint, because, and I wanna make this as universal as possible. Somebody out there might be watching this and they feel like, well, you know, what do you have for like those who maybe are less interested in freelancing, but maybe getting a job. You still wanna create value for the world. So you wanna create ideas that you can give other people. Um, so you might wanna start honing your style in, in a way that like this direction, like you come to me for this type of work, okay? And then you wanna start to research the marketplace and day to day of a photographer, which we've talked about. You wanna assess your needs. Again, we'll go back to this assessment a little bit later, and you wanna make those a priority. Um, we'll, we'll get into that in just a bit. You want to decide after that your name and business entity type. A lot of times people sit down and they're like, okay, well, my business name is gonna be this. I like that, sunflower photography, or um, you know, we're gonna be photographing dogs. Pick your pooch doc, uh, pick, pick your pooch LLC. And it's like, they've never really sat down and did the hard work from the beginning. And I've, I've, I've been there and done that. So just notice how like deciding your business name and all that stuff, that comes a little bit later down the pike. And then once you have the name, you still need to have a business plan and a, and a roadmap 
And that's before, and this is all just to get started. So again, it's the ideas, it's the research and assessments first. That will be your path to success. So the importance of assessments, I've said this a couple times and I wanted to kind of introduce that. Like, like people like, okay, well just tell me how to find clients. We'll get there, but again, it's about the order, it's about that mentality. So what, what are we doing these for? Because freelance is, in, is very um, mental. It's very up, much up here. And I've been a freelancer for 12 years. I've been a business owner. My mentality has shifted from a freelancer to an owner sometime in the last like three to four years um, because there's a transition phase. And there are, there's a big difference between freelancing and owning a business. And the core distinction between the two is freelancing, you're accepting gigs, you get paid for gig work. A business owner, you've created a process around you having gigs as a company and things are on autopilot. So you get paid when you, when you sleep. Both of these situations are fantastic and both of these situations can exist for a photography business. But for you to go from having a camera and having no business at all, no clients, to going to be a full-fledged business owner, that's a transition. And so you will likely start as a photographer, just a, I got a camera, I'm a good photographer, I take great pictures, to freelancing, getting your first few clients, to then turning that into a business. Hopefully that makes sense. So one of the things that you'll want to do when you're researching is you're going to want to learn how to do like a SWOT analysis um, because now we've established like some of the things you need to do. Um, and this is what, if you haven't seen one of these, hopefully you have seen one of these before, but if you haven't, basically the idea of this is to give you information about what's going on in the marketplace. By arming yourself with the information that's out there, you will be able to make better decisions. Okay, that's the purpose behind this. It helps contextualize how you and your offering are gonna stand up. Because anybody can have a theory about, hey, I'm gonna get my camera, I take these amazing pictures and they go do well. But like, have you put out the offering? And if you do put that offering out, it may fall flat on its face. As a business owner, that's gonna happen more frequently than I think a lot of people are gonna think. So doing things like these SWOT analysis, which is basically your strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. Early on in your business and in your freelancing, you're gonna sit down and you're going to really think. You're gonna get one of these, a pen and paper, and you're gonna to wanna to write these things down. You're gonna to wanna to ask some questions of yourself. You might wanna go through Google. You're gonna to wanna to look up a lot of information and you're gonna to wanna to record that information. The better notes that you take for yourself now, the easier things will be to make better decisions later. So SWOT analysis are very important. Um, but they're even important from another reason because a lot of what I'm talking about here is creating this this sort of this roadmap, this, this path um, where you do the hard work in the beginning and then the hard work you've done in the beginning helps you with the next step and then that next step helps you with, you know, it creates a process. So you wanna do research, then you wanna act on what you've learned and then you have to put it into practice with the marketplace. One of the things that I do see though a lot of times is people have this fear and I'm not saying this like it's, um, like it's like it's a like it's a like it's a bad thing. It's a natural thing. We all have fear because we're doing something we've never done before. But the more that you can see the fear, identify the fear, and still act anyway, that gives you a certain level of bravery, and it also sets you up for success. Because when you do all that research, you're arming yourself. So you're giving yourself a shield. Yeah, what you're, what you're you know, going into battle here in the, in the marketplace is kind of, um, it, it can be a little bit like scary because like what if I get eaten up and chewed up and, and spit out? Or what if I you know, throw some money into this? Like say, say you buy a couple cameras, say you hire a couple people and things don't work out. Well, if things don't, like things are more likely to work out when you don't do the research, when you don't know what you're doing. If you've watched Shark Tank before, 
um, you'll want to like you, you know that's a great show because it shows a lot of times how much people have really done their homework and done their research the more research that you do the better decisions you're going to make when you launch a promotion when you launch a sale when you approach a customer with a new product or a new service offering they're going to be more likely to go for it because you've created this product this service this offering with a certain customer profile in mind so it's targeted to them and it's not just a well anybody out there who's breathing might use pictures you know what I'm saying so the info that the marketplace gives you is is invaluable um, you have let's say you have a shiny new website but you're not getting any any homepage visits well that tells you something that tells you you just you spent money on this website but you don't have anybody coming that tells you okay I need to do something different something I'm different doing is not working or you've been running a sale for three weeks but you haven't had a single deposit or sign up again the marketplace is telling you information it's almost screaming at you so you gotta make sure that you're listening and that you're holding yourself accountable and I think this piece right here this accountability thing that is what distinguish, distinguishes a successful freelancer from an unsuccessful freelancer um, the more that you hold yourself accountable for your decisions that you make for holding yourself accountable for getting up in the morning I, I could tell you straight up I wake up every single day at 5 5 30 6 o'clock out of every day in 365 days there's maybe one day that I wake up after 8 o'clock and I was probably sick on that day so that's what I mean when I say holding myself accountable um, but I think the biggest thing here is being being willing to continuously review what you're doing and revise when it's not working okay so one of the things that you will want to do is to understand your unique value proposition and that is something whether you're a freelancer or whether you are a business owner um, or whether you are a um, um, somebody who wants to work full-time for a company all of those areas your unique value proposition as a person as a photographer as a photojournalist as a company owner that's something that you're able to do and the better you isolate for what is my value proposition to the marketplace the more money you're gonna make so you want to combine the research that I've been talking about doing that hard work with the findings from the self-assessment which again that resource will be here it's a it's a four page download you'll be able to um, get right in there spend some time with it you know so your value proposition is a unique blend of what you offer and it is no like nobody else's a good example would be like chick-fil-a and Wendy's anybody out there like chick-fil-a anybody like Wendy's I could tell you they serve the same customers but their value proposition is a little different and you know that honestly just because you serve same serve custom sorry serve the same customers doesn't mean that you have the same value proposition um, a photography example two wedding photographers one photographs um, like in a documentary style right they they document moments as they go they stay back in the cut They're, they spend time on the wall they don't have a major big personality but they get those moments and candids is what the customer can expect from them and then you've got somebody who's a little bit more like myself who's a little bit more present who's a little bit more active during the day um, I started with photojournalism like a journalistic style um, documentary style whatever you want to call it and I emphasize a lot of aspects of storytelling during the day we'll we'll spend time like that like maybe during cocktail hour doing that but at the end of the day the value proposition that I offer is I'm serving the role of like a, almost like an event planner like a wedding planner like a coordinator because the brides that choose me generally don't have one so I let these girls know like what like what the, how are things are supposed to go and even before the wedding day they call me they contact me they have a direct line of communication with me so I know that many wedding photographers don't do that but I'm not worried about what other people do I'm worried about what I do that helps my customer helps them sleep at night 
And so that's one of the things that I bring as, a, as, a, as my value proposition. So you have to find your value proposition. Um, so what, what does that mean? It means leaning into your uniqueness. It means refusing to let clients box you in with the others. Um, sometimes you'll, you'll post your pictures and everybody, it looks just like this. Um, that doesn't mean you have to reply to that on social media and say, no, it doesn't. But it does mean when you have these consultations with your client, um, when you're trying to find your customers and they, they, you know, sometimes they may say things or they may ask you, do you feel like, you know, you're one of many? You don't, you can answer that however you want or you don't have to answer that, but you want to show them what's different about you. Okay, so I want to do a quick time check here because I want to make sure we have enough time to get through everything. So another thing you want to do is, um, is, is, is look at your value proposition as a blend of what your brand is, what your experience is, the customer's experience, and then your product, like the services that are rendered to people. And again, it's a situation where it is part of all those things. Your brand is way more than just the logo. It's the website, and it's also the feeling that people get when they think of you. Your customer's experiences, that's, what the, that's the experiences that they have when they're interacting with your brand, whether they might see pictures you've taken, they could see your name in the news, stuff on social media. Um, so your proposition, what you're gonna determine, like is actually gonna bring you value, all of that is wrapped up in, in all three of these. It's a blend. Um, we've talked about like these steps and this is like, it looks like it's a complicated chart, but it's not. The graphic is really illustrating the, the importance of doing the research like we've talked about. So like we, we talk about this value proposition. If you're unfamiliar with that, we, we've looked at it on the other page, but like why is it important to really hone this in? Because it helps you knowing what you offer and how it stacks up in the marketplace. Remember, that's the value proposition. That helps you to uh, learn an appropriate and sellable cost. So by knowing like how you stack up in the marketplace, that affects the, the pricing. People are like, well, how to find clients? Yeah, before we get there, we need to figure out like, like what you're offering them. Are they gonna found, find it of any value and how much they might pay for it? Would they pay $50 for it? Would they pay $500 for it? Before you wanna go out there and sit down in front of people or email people or, or text people and they ask you how much you charge and then the next question you have is like, well, how much should I charge? If you do this research in the beginning to know like, okay, well, weddings in this area, they generally go for, let's say, 1500 to whatever. You know that, and then you know kind of like, okay, as long as we're offering this type of a range of value, we could expect that some customers who can afford it would pay that. That's what I mean when I say doing the research, one step leads to another. Is that making kind of sense for everybody? Okay, see some heads nodding here. So then knowing that value proposition will also help you figure out which revenue streams are available to you, right? So I mentioned I do photography, I do videography, I do aerials, right? Um, there's a such thing as like iPhone photography, like iPhone stock photography and stuff like that. Um, for what I'm doing, weddings, that revenue stream is not available to me. Now maybe for like, I guess commercial work, I guess there's some sort of market for it. Um, it's, it's not available to me. So I would make a mistake in trying to do that. Um, aerials, I do aerials, I do drone work. That's not really, a, that's not really like for, if you're doing pet photography, there's no revenue streams available for an aerial pet photographer. But for a videographer who does, sorry, um, drone photographer who does real estate, there's a definite market for that. So that, that's what I mean when I say seeing out, seeing which revenue streams are available to you so then it'll also help you with figuring out which marketing activities you should engage in so like knowing for instance um, I'm a pet photographer I'm not but say I was would I want to advertise pet photography in a bridal magazine probably not so that's what I mean when I say advertising and marketing activities so that, that's how these things all build on each other. Hopefully that's making some sense. But we want to do that research first. Your business's 
value proposition should be that of a problem solver. Ideally, you want to figure out where your customer's pain points are. And when you can turn those pains into gains, I know it's cheesy, but when you can, that's when you're getting paid, okay? So we've talked about this settling on a specialty or two. One of the reasons that you want to is it's going to take some time to effectively market for it. Um, you're not going to figure this out overnight. If you do, you're gonna you may pay a business coach and they'll give you the game, but you are gonna definitely want to um, definitely stick to I would say one or two because there are major nuances to advertising, marketing, closing certain sales um, effect. Excuse me, effectively. So the question is, which of your clients' problems are you solving through your brand experience? An example would be, these are my pictures. I took these two. And um, what I do is I solve fear for my brides. Um, they have all kinds of fears that may manifest themselves before they come to me, or maybe they won't manifest themselves until the day of their wedding. But with the nuances of this genre that I do, that this is like my bread and butter, there's a lot of fear. You gotta think about it. Weddings are a once in a lifetime, or maybe for some people twice, maybe three times, but generally speaking, this is a once in a lifetime event. It doesn't happen twice. There are no redo-overs, and they want to know that I'm going to show up. They want to know that somebody's going to show up. They want to know that somebody's going to show up on their day, not miss a beat, know exactly what to do, get perfect lighting for them, and no matter what happens, roll with the punches and end up with a gallery of 500 to 1,000 images every single time. They want to basically spend their money and no matter what, have no issues with poor lighting, no issues with posing and expression. They want to be told what to do, especially my customer. And when I say my customer, there's, a, there's thousands of types of customer profiles, but with the research of like what that I've done and also my experience of knowing who I prefer to work with, the type of person that spends money with me and my company they fall into this category very, very much. And so when I sit down with them, it's a very easy conversation because my marketing messaging speaks to this person. So it speaks to solving fear that they might have. You see how it all kind of dovetails and works together? My marketing messaging literally attracts this type of person. That person is literally looking for somebody who solves that problem. So. It, it, it literally we point back to each other and that's when marketing is done really well so when they have these fears of like the lighting might not be good or you might not whoever it is they may express these 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 questions during our consult but I'm prepared very quickly to answer those questions to we call those sales objections to deal with those sales uh, to to deal with those sales objections and they ultimately have their their fears um, soft, you know. So that's what I do with my marketing, and this is what I mean. This is an example of my marketing. My name, my company's name is Robert Burns II Second Photography, but I create resources that actually speaks to how we can help them win on their wedding day. Weekly videos to help them plan their stress-free wedding. Stress-free wedding help you plan. These are little things that I've put in there to kind of, you know, hint of like the value that my company brings. Now, another thing that we're doing is we're using images to tell stories. And this is how you can monetize your work as a photojournalist to make money, um, literally from your camera. A lot of people will take one picture and they'll post it but in this day and age, that's not good enough. You need a lot of content. And then it's like, well, just post a bunch of pictures. They don't really relate to each other. That doesn't do anything either. I feel like there's a lot of power in the photo set. So you want to use every image strategically. If I, you know, it's like uh, if you're designing for an album, right? Some people, you know, use uh, the, the, uh, the print medium to actually... To, to, to make entire businesses around their work. When you're designing for a photo album, you have to be very selective about which photos get into the album. Just like when you're designing a magazine. Maybe you were using InDesign in um, one of the, you know, the Grady classes. 
and you don't have limitless space. So with this particular, um, with the mindset of, of selectivity, pretend sometimes, give yourself little challenges. Say you could only use three pictures to tell the entire story of the wedding day. Well, you, you know, when like you're designing, maybe one image that showcases the venue, right? One image that, photo that showcases the couple. One image that showcases the group. So this is what I mean when I say storytelling. Now this works for me and my business for what I do, but the, the idea of doing this for any genre that you're in, whether that's sports, whether that's fashion, whether that is pet photography, whatever it is, the idea is the same. Use your images to tell stories rather than just look at this pretty picture I took. Same thing here. Same thing here. Another thing you can do, another idea, is using the experience of testimonials, like what other customers have, um, you know, how they, you know, we were talking earlier about brand, the difference between brand and experience. Well, when people interact with your brand, when they have an experience with your brand and they share it, which they sometimes do, but also when you ask them, if they do, you use those experiences to then share with others. Now I included these for a certain reason. I'm a wedding photographer. So this is actually on the right, it's straight off from my website, right? Um, but I also do boudoir. And sometimes people are like, well, how are you going to, like, how are you gonna do that? Like how, like, how can I get clients there? Well, that was a challenge for me, especially with me being a male and me being in a, basically in a field where, um, it's not the easiest thing in the world to get boudoir clients when you're a male. It's actually a lot easier if you're, if you're a female because when you do your market research, you'll find out that 80% of the, um, the, the people out there who consume and, and also are interested in boudoir photography are female. And so from the standpoint point of like doing it, there's a trust factor. So this is a way that you can actually use your um, the, the resources you have available to you to, to uh, effectively penetrate the marketplace. So I had the first few shoots and I used these testimonials, these reviews, I took screenshot of them, I asked for their permission, and I also was very um, uh, thoughtful. I, I blurted the last name, you see what I'm saying? So these are things that you can do to build trust and share brand experience. You do the same thing, um, whether you're a wedding photographer, whether you do portraits, again, it's transferable. What do you want your brand to be known for? You know, you could think about it from a service category standpoint of, you want to be known for photography, 360 tours, licensed aerials, or you could think about it from a genre standpoint, like is it gonna be engagements and weddings, will it be real estate and corporate, like really give that some consideration but I love shooting everything. All right, be prepared to confuse people. I would say now let's switch gears a little bit because there's so many things we could talk about and I wanna kinda of share some, a, a, a day in the life of like what the reality of doing this full time actually is, okay? So what do most people, what most people think that a photo career in photography actually is the assumption is that it's going to be 90% or more taking pictures um, and that only 10% of the time is going to be other stuff. I mean, some people honestly think it's 100%. But what most photographers actually end up doing is something that looks like this, where it's about maybe a little bit more than a quarter of actual photography and they spend more time editing than they do taking pictures. That is one of the pitfalls. What we do, it takes so much time. So much so that it's a common thing throughout the wedding plate, uh, the, throughout the wedding industry. Um, it's just a known thing. It's like a, it's like a, the, one of those jokes you hear at every single wedding. I'm walking around with my two cameras and people come up to me, oh yeah, it's gonna be like two months before you get these pictures back, huh? Huh? <laughs> you know, and it's funny. But at the same time, 
that's the reality. The, it's, it's a, the joke is right on point because most people get swamped in the editing and then the other things that actually get, um, the real stuff that actually gets the business is other 20%, that's the only thing that this, this time is, is, is left for. So it's like, okay, what is the actual other 20%? We're gonna get there because if you do what most successful and profitable photographers actually do, and I would say um, that this is kind of where I fall in. This would be like why um, somebody like me would be giving this this talk is because the decisions that we make. And that was kind of what we started off was looking like the decisions for what we're doing with our time every day. The better that you're able to segment your time and dedicate your precious 24 hours to doing some of these things um, and don't look at the decimal points. That's, that's not the point of this. The point of this is for you to see that there's a lot of things that you gotta be doing. If you want to be um, successful, whether this is getting a job in photography or keeping a job as a full-time staff photographer, which I've done, or being a freelancer or building a business, but especially if you're looking to build a business, especially, you need to do all these things. You're gonna to want to sell as much time as possible selling. Of course you wanna shoot, but you're only gonna shoot about 10% of the time. You're gonna edit, but you're gonna try and uh, limit the editing to as much as you can. Some people want to spend a lot of time editing, and for them, they're gonna to want to outsource the other things, whether that would be graphic design for uh, advertising and marketing, whether that's gonna be customer service, they'll hire somebody to answer the phones, to pound the phones, to find them new clients. They would um, hire out somebody like an H&R block or maybe a, an accountant who will do that kind of stuff. So outsourcing will be a thing. Um, but if you're not gonna outsource, that means that you're gonna spend a lot of time doing all these things. So now we're starting to get into the nuts and bolts and the meat of this presentation. And it's like, well, okay, so Robert, what do you do? Well, I actually outsource uh, for a lot of this stuff. I actually have three to four people on my staff at any given point. Um, and I made the transition last year from it being just me to now it being four, five, six, sometimes seven, eight people working for me, doing all of these things so that I can do what I like to do. Um, but that's not gonna happen day one. So it's not about being in a lofty position because one of the things that you gotta do is you still have to manage all that. And that's something I still have challenges with. So, but it is important for you to realize that the success recipe is doing a lot of these things as much as you can. Um, and really focusing on this part right here, this gold part, the selling piece. One of the things that you want to do is think about your business like a baby. And from the standpoint of, you know, this baby is a, is a, is a little toddler. He's, he's kicking and screaming, he's crying. Sometimes he, he, he messes his diaper or she messes her diaper. But eventually this business will grow up and support you. A lot of people wanna pull money out of their business. You want to wait. You definitely want to wait. You wanna pull money out of, out of the freelancing situation. You got your first client, let's say you, you, you did it for 100 bucks. You want to go take you know, 20 bucks and go spend it on whatever. You wanna resist that temptation to pull money out of the business until you're really, really profitable, until your business can support itself because right now, it depends on you to live. You can't depend on it to live. This is like the thing that a lot of people really struggle with and the sad part is, this is not the most exciting part, but this doesn't happen for a few years. Uh, when I say a few, I'm looking at, I know, dozens and dozens of dozens of photographers who have been doing photography for 10 plus years. They're still not profitable. So there are some examples of people who will start and two years in, they're profitable. But they came in doing a lot of that and not that. So the more of that you do, right here, this, the less, the, mo the more time it's gonna take for you to actually take money out of the business. You're gonna want to readjust when things aren't working. 
Um, this this is this will definitely be what you're gonna want to do because um, things aren't always gonna work, and also you're gonna have the challenges of some people will find that entrepreneurship isn't for them, and I have to say that not everybody's cut out for entrepreneurship. So for those people who are looking for a an opportunity to get hired as a full time photographer or uh, even a part time photographer like on staff somewhere um, some things that you're going to want to um, some things that you're going to want to uh, look at and do you're going to want to perfect your resume you're going to want to tweak it for every single job and you are going to you're going to want to tweak it for every single job that you do you want to perfect yours you're going to need to apply to five times more jobs than you think that you're going to need to um, because there's a lot of competition out there. There's a lot of people looking to do what you do and everybody has a nice value proposition. So you're going to want to paper the market and make sure that your name is out there. Um, having a strong, robust body of work will help greatly, yes, but your work product isn't the only thing that's getting you the job never want to be late to any job interview or any freelance gig for that matter. Um, being late can cost you opportunities. You will definitely want to cultivate the best aspects of your personality to let yourself shine during, shine through during your interview. So, uh, you know, your work is going to be great, but your personality can get you the job. Um, your work alone might get you the job as well, but having your personality on point will make a big difference. Uh, you're not going to want to accept excuses um, or make excuses. Um, you don't want to make excuses or accept them from yourself. Now, some tips for you out there who might want to get a job as a full-time photographer. Um, I would say gone are the days of the boring resume. Uh, there was a day and time when you just spent, uh, you just you know, you wrote words on a page and you mailed it in to a company, like literally, like physically mailed it. But now everything's digital. So having a digital resume, something that stands up in the current marketplace, that's what's gonna help you. And the question is, do you want to blend in with the crowd or do you wanna stand out? The more different that you are, the better, especially in this creative field. So ideas for the resume that's a little bit different. You'll want to showcase your imagery if you can. If you know that you're going to apply to a, a um, you know, let's just say an, an a, a, um, animal company or like a like to be to work in a, a vet's office or something, you're going to want to showcase um, your work that might be relevant to the job. Um, even if you don't showcase your work on the resume or your cover letter, you still want to be able to have a nice portrait of yourself. Um, after all, you are a photographer. Um, you can use edgy font choices um, that maybe some other people in other fields couldn't. Um, and you can also use metrics to quantify what it is that you do. So like here on this example, you can create charts and graphs that visually feature um, what it is that you do in terms of bottom line metrics. Um, remember, you're creative, so you get more leeway than maybe some of the Terry students. And I will certainly say that putting in twice as much of the effort will yield dividends. So these are some tips that you can have um, by your side when things maybe aren't working, whether you're a freelancer or whether you have a full-time job. Um, some things that kind of stand out. If you're gonna be doing this as a business, you're gonna wanna get insured. Um, you want to maintain an ironclad, ironclad contract. So as little handshake business as possible, this will protect you as well as your customers, your clients. Um, being reputable, doing the work. Customer service should be a top priority. You want to make it your business to get back to people in a reasonable amount of time, and you ultimately want to be dependable. Thinking outside of the box. You know, everybody thinks about National Geographic and you know, Vogue magazine, but what about the smaller businesses that also need photography? I mean, these companies do pay as well. Continuously adapting to technology and where things are headed 
knowing industry trends, you do need to know them because clients are going to ask for them, you know? Light and airy, dark and moody, or whether you're using a drone or maybe a 360 tour. If you kind of know what's going on in the industry, that will help you as far as, um, as far as satisfying what clients are wanting. Remembering that this is a competitive sport and that's why there's so much competition because there's a lot out there. So um, knowing networking, a sense of community over competition is gonna pay dividends. So creating a tribe, nurturing relationships, um, those things will help you. And remember, you don't have to be the best. You just wanna be known for something. So when things aren't working, like remember, selling, producing fire images alone isn't gonna be enough. Remembering what you're doing is a service to people and that when you position that service as a method of making their other people's lives easier, that's when you get paid. Remembering to not make excuses or accepting them from yourself. Authenticity, it's okay to be yourself. Creative, creating systems, making processes for your business, that's what's gonna help um, when things aren't going to work. So systematizing things so you free your time up, that's what's gonna help. Being consistent is the key to, 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 to leveraging social media. And I would say if, you're, if you want to avoid that starving artist photographer life, then you're gonna to wanna to avoid some of those standard photographer pitfalls, such as buying way too much gear, spending far too much time editing and not creating those processes, going down that info overload rabbit hole, and not taking action. Uh, remember, the core, when things aren't working, is that storytelling structure that you learned in the Grady School of Journalism. Gear isn't everything. Know your gear and what it can achieve, but don't rely only on your gear. If you're gonna rely on only one thing, rely on your personality and your storytelling. To rely on those things, though you can control that far more than, than your gear. Um, you wanna invest in your education every single day. Whether you do, you think you do or not, you're gonna to need to know the psychology of sales to actually work with people. Because you need to understand why people buy and maybe why they don't. Um, here, you know, with this forums and this groups piece, the validation. Uh, you know, one of the reasons people get into photography um, is because the camera allows them to express themselves through art. And once you start to get into these forums, these groups, or even these contests, it's not that there's something wrong with them, but they can be a rabbit hole that you go down and you spend a lot of your time chasing the validation that you will find from other people telling you your work is good. That's the same thing that you get with the social media, people clicking the like button. With these contests, you get the validation of a trophy. You get the validation of an image that places high, but you, and you also get the negative piece of that. You get the bashing that people will get when they don't win. You get the negative comments that the haters will leave on social media. Um, even though there are benefits and there's positives to these contests, such as the, the prize money, such as um, the recognition, the validation, those can be double-edged swords and you find yourself going down the rabbit hole where you're obsessive about something that um, ultimately, if you're, are you trying to make money or are you trying to go for this validation? So when things aren't working, really come back to these issues and, and wonder like, like, am I, am I falling victim to this? Another thing to look at is the productivity piece. If things aren't working, try to find ways to create efficiencies with what you're doing. And some things like creating a dedicated work area. I'm here in my office right now. Uh, also, um, you know, even just like a dedicated studio where you can shoot at. These are some things that can help you from a productivity standpoint. Now, one of the things that I definitely hear a lot of times is, I just started, people aren't giving me opportunities. Well, how about instead of waiting for others to give you one, you consider to find ways um, that you can be resourceful and use what you already have to create opportunities for yourself. Enter the style shoot. 
So when I first started doing weddings about six years ago, maybe seven now, it's been a while, um, I broke in because huh, I didn't break into another business. I actually uh, broke into this industry. And how I did it, because I felt like, like, like a lot of people felt like nobody was giving me an opportunity. I was like, well, I want to still, uh, I, I still want to be in this in industry. So I created opportunities for myself where I did what we call style shoots and I created, uh, you know, this particular model here was actually one of my very first style shoots ever. And I let her know that you know, because she actually had a wedding dress um, because she was married before, but she was divorced, so she still had her wedding dress. So I reached out and said, hey, would she actually want to just do a photo shoot in the river? Because I thought these images would be marketable. Um, and they ended up being very marketable. I used them in many different ways over the course of a few years. And uh, I still am using this image today for a presentation. And this is how I broke in. I did I don't remember, it must have been six or seven different styled shoots, quote unquote fake weddings, or not even a wedding, just like opportunities where a bride is wearing a gown so that people can see how I take photographs and like what I do. So that's what I was able to do. This is another image from a style shoot that I did with a company called Alice Andrews Designs um, a few years ago now, several years ago. And um, when people say that nobody's responding to your second shooter applications or nobody's replying to emails to get your foot in the door the key to making it happen is to create your own opportunity now you don't have to do this in the wedding industry you could do this in any industry um, you could um, if you if you want to start doing fashion work you could literally go to Target and pick up some of the most inexpensive clothes um, and find yourself a model and even I mean whether you pay them or if they like some of the other work you've done and you have a good relationship with them, you know, they're friends of yours, or you could ask them, hey, would they take pictures? You'll buy the clothes. Um, you'll maybe pay for the gas if they're coming from another city or something like that. And you create opportunities for yourself. And then you share the images with them, let them know, like, like hey, I want to be able to use this for my portfolio. And sometimes people will say yes. Some people won't say yes, but that's okay. You want to create your own opportunities and you don't want to rely on anybody else and especially not if you're going to make an excuse for why you can't be successful you can be successful so for some so you know I wanted to share some examples for local photographers in in the Georgia area who you might recognize um, one of them is Blaine Marable um, and he's a phenomenal um, example of uh, how to make it as a photographer. Blaine, uh, I don't know him personally, but I'm just using his first name because he's a known name in Athens. I went to school in Athens uh, in 2006 is when I, uh, sorry, 2010 is when I graduated college and I was hearing his name in 2008. Um, and I believe he was doing stuff since before then. Um, so he, is, he started off doing um, sports for the dogs and he also like football like football photography and he you know now he he uh, he started off doing like graduations and like now he does um, like football for them but he built his brand doing that so you can see he's got a very strong following on on Instagram and he's very consistent with how he does stuff so he would be a good example of somebody local to follow um, and, and just kind of success model afterwards. So I would definitely say that if you can make researching other photographers a habit, this will help you with doing your research. But there's also uh, another way that you can do this, and if you go to expertise.com, expertise um, no matter what city you live in, they can actually find other photographers for you that are known in this given specialty. So that will be an example of, of like a, a, somebody who's doing it well you're not going to start off and be blame you're not going to start off and have some robust business with seven people working for you things are going to start off a little bit rougher and uglier um, and there's no getting around that but the good news is that it does get better so like here an example will be my logo I started with this logo I didn't even have a logo um, like eight years ago eight nine years ago 
Um, I think I got this made in 2014. But I did, um, I, I did actually get this redone about three years ago now. So this is where it went from here to here. And the key to making it all happen is uh, keep pushing, learn from your experiences. And instead of chasing immediate perfection, embrace being okay with like refining and tweaking as you go. That's going to be the ticket for you. So the quick wins versus the long game. You want to shoot right now and you have to shoot, set up a lot of shoots right now, but very quickly, start setting things up for later so that your budding business has a true infrastructure. The really the key here is to balance both. Now, some things about like, you know, what it is that I'm known for because I've said a lot through this presentation, you want to be known for something rather than being the best. And I wanted to make sure that I shared a little bit of insight about like like what I mean by that. So I'm not, I don't consider myself super known for anything, but if I was known for something, the clients that hire me, they're choosing me for these reasons. Does that make sense? So I use a lot of color. I'm unapologetic about the color that I use in my work. And so much so that it's become a stylistic thing. The more that I lean into that style, the more I attract the people who want color and I also subsequently repel the people who don't want bold color very trendy thing right now is like the dark and muted tones they call it dark and moody wedding photography you know the the, the greens are crushed from a photography standpoint um, but like I lean into what I like and what I'm good with so I lean into my posing I lean into a, a supreme customer first mindset I'm more satisfied with like satisfying like I'm more um, I'm more focused on making sure that my customer is happy than I am with um, you know um, making myself happy um, but I you know these are some things that I'm that I'm that I'm I, I'm known for with the clientele that I've got wide angle focal lengths that kind of thing um, there's some pictures that I had published in Elegant Magazine a couple years ago. Again, the bold color. Again, the posing. Um, these are some things that, that, you know, that I will definitely go ahead and, and, and do. So this is an image that I shot this past weekend at a wedding that I did in Charleston, South Carolina. Um, so those are some things about me that, I'm, that, I'm, that I would consider myself known for from a, from a client standpoint. As we start to kind of um, move into the next part, I wanted to share some advice for some of the newer photographers out there, but I also wanted to create an opportunity where some of my peers within this field could share insight as well, because I feel like you benefit more when you have, you know, like we're talking about the research, to be able to share this information from a standpoint of other f successful photographers um, have great insight to share as well. So I found four other people that I've known for years that are doing things very successfully. And the first is Jordan Pierce of JP Photography here in Charlotte. So I asked him, to, I asked him as well as all the others to give uh, just a few bullet points. Here's what he said. My top, my top three tips and bullet points. In order to make a successful business out of photography, you must first invest your time in order to make that money. By this, by, by this, I mean when you start out, you'll be dedicating more time in marketing, networking, and offering free or discounted shoots to get your name out there. Two, always consider to continue to better yourself. Look and research and find new ways to make your sessions and editing more efficient and worthwhile. Time is everything, Money, time is money, and time is what you need to be successful. It's not an overnight thing. You have to work at it and be dedicated to the process. During a photo shoot, take your time and get your shots right. Don't rush anything during the photo shoot. It will make your editing process easier and more efficient. Three, never give up. You will hit a wall at some point. There will be something that pulls you away from photography, but never give up. It will be hard. You will feel like you're wasting your time and not making any money. But keep at it. Keep your head up and believe in yourself, because if you don't believe in yourself, no one else will believe in you. Here's another photographer, local, Jeremy Deal. 
he's in, um, in, in Raleigh, North Carolina, so he's kind of local to Carolina for me. He said the first thing about, and he's a real estate guy, um, the first thing you should know about being a professional photographer is your entire job will be created something else, someone else's vision. You grow up thinking about how wonderful it will be to photograph whatever you want and however you want to do it. But the harsh reality is, is that you want to get paid as a creator, that will rarely be the case. Photography for your soul is not difficult. You are the creator, the photographer, and the client. You get to, tr you get to create what you want, when you want, and how you want it to look. But as soon as you go professional, your entire job will be crafting someone else's vision of perfection into a single deliverable frame. It is not as easy as it sounds. Photographing for paying clients is difficult. I am a real estate photographer, he says, and architectural photographer, mainly, and that means that my vision of their project is irrelevant. It is my job to give them the images they desire and are paying me for, and not to just deliver what I think looks cool. That means that serious homework is required by me before I walk on site every day. So if you thought your days of homework were over just because you graduate, it is just getting started. Your career as a photographer will entail, entail so much more than just taking photographs. As a matter of fact, he says, taking up photos only consists of about 15 to 25 percent of the work I do. So what I spend most of my days doing has nothing to do with picking up a camera. Every morning I spend about two hours just making sure my website is up to date, social media posts are ready to go, email requests and questions are responded to, and finally I make sure the financials for my company are all in line. After that, I go through the gear I will use for the day and make sure it is charged up and operational because nothing worse, nothing looks worse to a client than showing up unprepared. Finally, once I'm all packed up, I hit the road for the day and finally get to do some photography, but that is not the only part of my job. I must interact with clients, agents, homeowners, and pets with respect even when they do not deserve it. I must move around and stage properties when I arrive, which is just one of the many things I had to teach myself through continuing education. I must be a pet and people wrangler while trying to photograph these spaces. Once I'm all done, I must go home and edit the images that I took that day, and every agent has a different style they want their images to look like. What I'm trying to say is, no matter how what your fo photo job is, photography will be a ridiculously small part of it compared to running your business. What, I, what you know about photography gets you to where you are, but your desire to continue educating yourself is what will make you successful. It was my desire to take the continuing education to get Drone 107 certified that allowed me to introduce aerial services to my clients, which in turn caused my customer base to grow. It was my desire to learn how to stitch together 360 cam in the virtual tours. I say all this to tell you that even though photography is an incredible career, it's difficult. If you're wanting to become a photographer because you think it's easy money, then you are sadly mistaken. When you start off, you'll be required to work for a discounted rate. I would never recommend working for free. Always recommend to barter or trade to those potential clients. When you're finally confident enough to charge what you're worth, there will be another disintegration of your current client base. But you acquire new clients with higher budgets too. Just as with every profession you choose, you must be dedicated to the craft. You must put in the hard work and not learn things not related to photography to at all to thrive. You must care. Instead, I thought I know for me personally, it is only my desire to enhance my craft that has got me where I am and allowed me to not only survive in the cutthroat world of photography, but instead I thrive on the challenges of photography as a career brings me. Another example would be Matt Schmidt, and he's an artistic photographer. He's an art photographer based in High Point. And he had some interesting words as well. His work is phenomenal, just as Jeremy's and Jordan's is. Here's another one. I truly live within this art community and love it immensely. It is the one thing that allows us to be unique as we possibly can and also influence and touch the world if we choose with our message. One thing I always tell people coming into photography is keep moving forward. It's such a simple concept to follow no matter what happens. Mistakes, misfires, obstacles, changes in season of our lives, as long as you keep moving forward, you will realize you didn't give up. One's art can appreciate that, that it was clay one day, and sometime down the road it became Rodan or Nagel. Another thing I'm passionate about is helping people, lend, helping people up, lending a hand, lowering that experienced ego, 
and fostering the next potential Picasso, Cindy Crawford, or Peter Colson. It's been a harsh criticism of myself that I've not reached those heights and lost lofty plateaus yet. I feel like the universe works like this though. We may not be the star, but we can definitely contribute our stardust into the community or artists and raise a star together. So keep learning your crafts, stand by your work, and pay it forward whenever you can. Because history is always looking for martyrs, saints, devils, and a few select artists whose work speaks to humanity. Lastly, we have Tony Shaw. She's from the Shaw Photography Group based in Greensboro, North Carolina. She says, One of the most important things that I would advise an up-and-coming photographer or a person who just has an interest in exploring their gift of photography further than the average person would be to get as much advice from someone that has a tremendous amount of experience, but don't just stop there. Do your own research. Do what makes sense. Don't be afraid to fail. This means that you might practice, you might purchase the wrong equipment, you might lose an important image, you might not be hired for the job, list goes on. These instances are just trials to see if you are as serious as you say you are about the thing that you say you love to do. She says study lighting, color, composition, posing, sales, pricing, workflow, and consistency. So when keep shooting, she says, practice when you don't feel like practicing. So I give you these examples of what other folks are saying so that you can see that it's not just me. It is not just me saying these things of be consistent, stay committed. It's not, it's not just me. This is how you do it. You have to stay committed. You have to, like Tony says, you got to look at the sales and marketing stuff. It's not just color and composition. It's not just lighting. It, it, you know, this, that's what you got to do. So as we wrap up, these are some resources for you. And I would say definitely go ahead and um, we've talked about this assessment a few times. You wanna take this assessment at the beginning of your photography business journey, once per year or whenever you feel like you're stuck um, because it will help you. But you wanna do this 10, 15, 25 minutes maybe even with quiet and in reflection. Don't rush this. Really take your time with this. This will help you to assess like how ready you really are. These are the artists again that uh, the fellow artists that I that I put in there a few minutes ago. You can find these people here. And as as we as we close here, I just wanted to leave you with this: success is the sum of small efforts, repeated day in and day out. And I don't think that there we could find anything that's even better than what Mr. Collier said. He's an art author um, that was um, that wrote all throughout the last deck, the last century. Um, very highly successful um, self-help books. So that's how you get to that pot of gold is the sum of small efforts. So I'm going to leave some room for questions. Any questions? All right. So thank you so much, everybody. Uh, again, I appreciate the University of Georgia. Uh, Mark Johnson, shout out to you. Um, Samantha, thank you for the opportunity. Um, we're going to close out the presentation here and I'm going to go ahead and in, in, this, um, in, in this presentation, I've got the links to the business readiness assessment as well as the slides for this presentation. So thank you once again and I, will, um, I hope you guys have great success on your journey.